Are you having some problem with that? Are you having any problem with that? That's what we need to do. We all need to go back to our first love. Lord Jesus Christ, when everything we did for him was for his glory, praise, and honor, and because we loved him, understanding that he first loved us. And we need to go back, each and every one of us. We need to go back to our first love. There's an article that I'll mention a little bit later where even though uh, percentage-wise black people have been hit the hardest with this plague, not only in America but around the world, not in Africa but in other countries, Great Britain as well, and, but yet the Pew Research Organization said that it has uh, caused the black community, generally speaking, uh, to get right regarding their faith, uh, that their faith has been strengthened through the novel coronavirus plague. And that is needed, not only among black folk, but everybody, white folk, red folk, yellow folk. That is the purpose of a plague. Let's pray. Holy Father God, we praise you and we thank you for that beautiful song, Take Me Back, a, a song long forgotten by many, but one that needs to be brought back online, especially 
in a time like this. And so, Lord, help us to not only enjoy the song and be blessed by the song, but, Lord, help us to be convicted by the song and help us to do what the gospel song says. Help us to go back to you, our first love, know that you first loved us, and Lord, uh, you've always wanted us to love you back, and to respect you, to reverence you, to fear you, to not marginalize you, not uh, push you out to the periphery of our lives. In fact, you have always wanted to be the center of our lives, since you not only created us, you then died for us and redeemed us. So, Lord, you own us through and through, and yet we act like we are not owned. We act like we are little gods ourselves, sitting on the throne of our lives. So, Holy Father God, on this Thursday night, we praise you and we thank you for your grace and your goodness, your mercy, your long-suffering, and your loving kindness towards such wretched, wicked, evil, and ungodly people as we are. And we, hopefully, everybody, who names the name of Christ, we individually and collectively, we confess our sins, our failures, our faults unto you. Lord, for Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive us of our sins. As we from our hearts, by your grace, forgive those who have sinned against us. And Holy Father God, that was a good report to hear today. Lord, this was indeed a wake-up call for uh, black Christians, but it is indeed a wake-up call for white Christians, red Christians, yellow Christians, all Christians everywhere. But somehow the Pew Research uh, Organization zeroed in on the black community. And so that is encouraging. But, Lord, I do pray that we would not just reconsider, but that we would repent. That we would not just uh, say, uh, this has caused my faith to grow deeper, but that we would go deeper in righteousness and holiness and godliness, confessing our sins, repenting of our sins, turning from our evil ways and uh, getting back to you, our first love. So, Lord, we pray that you would empty us of ourselves, crush and crucify, Lord, our flesh afresh and anew. For those of us who have trusted you as Savior, fill us with the fullness and the power, the unction and the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Not only, Lord, so that there will be an outward change, uh, for most of us we're suffering from the sins that are on the inside. Our lives are messed up because of the sins we harbor on the inside, such as bad attitudes, uncheerfulness, unjoyful. Resentment, bitterness, anger, hatred, pridefulness, and not only pridefulness, pharaohistic pride, stubbornness, rebelliousness, which is as the sin of witchcraft. And Lord, these are the sins that are taking people down. 
destroying people's lives, even destroying their health, harboring all of this evil. It's sad to say, Lord, uh, some in the church are even, are even rather demon-possessed. Holy Father God, we pray, Lord, tonight that you would cast out the devil and the demons of hell and the satanic, demonic, demonic spirit of Judas, and the satanic, demonic spirit of Sanballat and Tobias. These people who claim to be Christians here and out there but they cannot stand for your work to go forward. They cannot stand for a good report regarding your work on earth. But they rejoice over insignificant things like someone dropping a new record or a sporting event. They don't mind cheering and shouting and jumping and dancing for that. But when it comes to the Lord's work, they... They have no excitement whatsoever, no joy, no happiness, no pleasure, no gladness of heart, no cheerfulness. And the Lord, that is demonic. There's something wrong somewhere. When people can smile and laugh and giggle and jump for joy for everything in the world, football, baseball, basketball, concerts, movies, but not for you. If a soul gets saved, no joy. Down here on earth, there's joy we know in heaven in your presence, but not here. To the point where people don't even invite people uh, to church anymore, and that's the very least that one can do as a Christian. People don't even pass out gospel tracts. That would be the second least. People don't even uh, witness to people anymore. And preachers don't even preach the gospel anymore. So, Holy Father God, help us to pray, to seek your face, to turn from our wicked ways, and to humble ourselves before you. and uh, to get back to you our first love. And Holy Father God, we pray, Lord, tonight that you would demonstrate the power of your Holy Spirit as you uh, have done so many times in the past, not because of us, but in spite of us. For, Lord, we don't deserve your presence. We don't deserve your anointing. We don't deserve your unction. We don't deserve your power. We don't deserve... Uh, what Paul called utterance, the ability to string words together that we have never strung before and will never st uh, string uh, again together, but somehow they come to our hearts and minds as preachers uh, so wonderfully and so powerfully, even though in other cases we may not be good speakers at all. That's your anointing, your unction, your utterance, the power of your Holy Spirit. And every true preacher knows that there are many things, many thousands of things that he has said from the pulpit that were not in his study, were not in his notes. He never learned them in seminary or Bible college, but he gets it directly from you, from heaven, while in the moment of preaching. That is a, that's an amazing thing and, and, and an amazing feeling. And we give you the glory, praise, and honor for that, for there's still power in preaching. Uh, it is the most powerful form of communication on earth. And uh, Holy Father God, even though this is a briefing, not a preaching situation, I do preach in it. For I must preach the gospel for the dying uh, who are heading out into eternity. In fact, that's the main driving force behind these briefings. So many thousands of folks are dying in America alone in their inaccurate count. Uh, they say over 2,000 people are dying a day regularly, every day. At one point, that was a milestone, and we were supposed to go down. Uh, and 
now we are seeing over 2,000 people die in America a day and uh, people act like there's nothing going on. When the truth of the matter is, it's more like 4,000 a day to 5,000 a day. And Lord, uh, uh, the only reason why I'm up here is because of what you put in my heart to do, and that is to proclaim the gospel and to try to encourage some saints along the way. For these are very serious times and perilous times. And Holy Father God, I pray that you'd bless and protect uh, our family and all other families under the sound of my voice and all other Christian families from ourselves, from our flesh, and from the devil, and from the demons of hell. Lord, unfortunately, we have family members who have demons or have a demon, and I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would cast the demons out. I know that that is not popular today in our uh, prosperity gospel religion, fake religion, but there are still demons in the world, and they are making themselves known more and more, even in so-called Christian families. We plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, give us sweet victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. Protect us, Lord, from evil people in the church. Protect us, Lord, from evil people in the family, evil people in the world, evil people on the job, evil people in business and in the military. Surround us all with your protection as your people, a band of your holy angels, a wall of your holy fire tonight. Place upon us the whole armor of God and give us sweet victory. Pave the way for us. Open up doors for us that no man can shut as we stand between the living and the dead. And Holy Father God, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight that you deliver us all from temptation, evil, and sin. And deliver us, Lord, from all spiritual and uh, mental, physical, emotional, family, financial, material, food, legal, student loan. Uh, issues, college problems, and future issues and problems for everybody in every family. And Lord, we pray that uh, you will uh, give us your grace and your strength and the power of your Holy Spirit to plow through. Grant us your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit to love right, live right, think right, and do right, and act right in our homes and in our lives. And we Thank you in advance. Uh, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to lift up, Lord, uh, your holy name and lift up your son's name and receive all glory to your son. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Focus at the top, back there. Move over to the middle. I can't hear you. Give that to her. Give give that to her. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, 
Welcome to the How to Stay the Coronavirus Plague Briefing, believe it or not, podcast episode number 39, 39. My name is Daniel White third president of Gospel Light Society International. And I say all of that because this is the only live podcast we do. We do over 40 podcasts. Um, And this one is the only one that's live for audio and video. Please turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel, chapter 24, verse 21, and then 25. And Ariuna said, Wherefore is my Lord the King come to his servant? And when you get a chance, read this whole, this entire story. is one of the most painful stories, but it's a beautiful story, historical story. And David said, to buy the threshing floor of the, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. So again, my beloved, the sin problem has to be dealt with. That is, We know Jesus Christ dealt with the sin problem on the cross, but unfortunately, his people still sin. And so that's why the Bible tells us we need to confess our sin. And we need to repent of our sins and turn from our evil ways. And uh, I can almost guarantee you that you still have some family members who don't believe God. They don't believe that this is a plague sent by God because of the evil and the sins of the people in the church, first and foremost. This includes the family and then the government. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says, after David received the report, he realized his sin of pride and self-sufficiency and confessed this sin, which he called a very foolish thing to the Lord. The Lord then sent Gad, a prophet, to David with a list of three calamities from which he could choose. Uh, God God was basically saying through the prophet, now a calamity is going to come. But I don't know, God might have loved David so much that he gave David a choice. He didn't give Moses and them a choice. But he gave David a choice. I, I don't know. The calamities are coming, though. Uh, a calamity is coming. Let me give you a chance to choose. And by which the Lord would register his displeasure and purge out the evil, that is, David's pride and his self-sufficiency. See, this, this is the sin that we have committed by marginalizing God, pushing him out to the, to, to the periphery of our lives. God demands to be the center 
of our life. Now, we sing it on Sunday morning. You are the center of our life and all that. You sit on the throne of my heart and all those lies we say in church with our dirty hands lifted up. But we don't mean it. See, see God hates pride. He, he hates for us to think that we can handle it on our own. And he knows we can't. Just like some of us parents of grown children, we, we know that the child uh, is not ready for everything he or she is getting ready to face. You, you did your part in raising him or her. But, uh, you know, we have these proud children who want to go out half-cocked, not believing what you told them, and then they get uh, cold cocked upside the head, and then they want to cry and boo-hoo and act like they never heard the truth before. And that's how we are towards God. We want to stretch out and do things on our own without acknowledging him, without putting him first. And then when God blesses us a little bit, we think we really got it going on and we forget God. And that's what we have done. The choices were three years of famine. Three months of enemy pursuit and three days of pestilence. All of those things are bad. David chose the third option, throwing himself on the mercy of God. The result was a plague which took the lives of 70,000 people. Now, not David's life. But it's, it's something when, because of your sin and your pride and your foolishness, when nearly 100,000 people lose their lives because of you. So those of you who are in business, those of you who got things going on online, playing the numbers game online, it's best to not check all of your money and your high numbers, how many people are following you every morning uh, before you pray. I mean, you don't, you do all of that and do all your business and look at how much you have accomplished and then you don't pray as you should. So pray first and then check your numbers. Put God first and then check how much money you made overnight, if you knew. When Jerusalem itself was threatened, the Lord intervened and commanded his angelic destroyer to desist. David then confessed his own personal sin and urge the Lord to spare his innocent people. Then in order to make proper restitution and atonement, David arranged to construct an altar to the Lord, probably remembering the word of God with uh, regarding Moses and Aaron. Gad told him, the prophet, that it must be built on the threshing floor of Arunah, a citizen of Jerusalem, since it was there that the angel had been commanded to cease his destruction of the city. According to well-founded tradition, this threshing floor 
a wide, smooth ledge-like surface was on Mount Moriah, just outside the northern wall of David's Jerusalem. But David had no right to it because it was owned by a citizen. When Aryana learned of David's desire, however, he was willing not only to give the threshing floor to the king, but also to provide the wood and sacrifices needed. <coughs> To this gracious offer, David could only give a negative response. How could he sacrifice to the Lord what cost him nothing? That would be a denial of the very meaning of sacrifice. Aryana therefore sold him the threshing floor and oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Fifty shekels was about one and a half pounds of silver. Silver. The silver David paid was only for the oxen and the threshing floor. Threshing floor. And these things mentioned in First Chronicles uh, twenty-one twenty-five was for the lot of land surrounding the threshing floor. Having obtained the site, David built the altar, offered the sacrifices, and interceded on behalf of his people. God heard and answered, and the land was healed of the plague. This was where Abraham had offered Isaac. And on this same spot, Solomon later constructed his magnificent temple to honor God. So what are we to do? I know you don't want to hear it, but what God wants us to do is go to the altar, confess our sins, not for a show, but for real, and repent of our sins. Second Chronicles. 714 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God is so gracious and so merciful and so loving and so long-suffering with us. He would do the same for us if we would do that. But most of us are not in a mood to do that. By the way, in that Pew article, it was only 58% of black folk who said the plague has deepened their faith, which means a lot that phrase, deepen their faith, means many things. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else, Jesus said, I will Come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. He says that twice with emphasis. And you see, and you see, just like you're not in the mood uh, to repent, most of us, God is not in the mood to play. He's heard a whole lot of confessions before. I don't think he's that, that interested in confessions. He's interested in change. He wants the bad behavior to stop because the bad behavior 
the evil that we are doing proves that we don't love him. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, we're great confessors. Some of us are great admitters, but we're not great repenters. Saying no to the evil behavior. Saying no to the devil. Saying no to your flesh. That's what, that's what, uh, mature Christians have to do every day. People who have repented, they may be, listen to me, you may still be tempted, but you got to learn how to say no to the devil and to everything that's evil in you. You got to say no to the devil in your flesh for sure. And it, and listen to me, it's going to be a battle every day on some of these temptations. But you will not win the battle if you don't learn how to say no. That's what walking in the Spirit will help you do. Say no to your evil, your besetting sins, your weights. That's what God wants to see now. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say, church? And and make no mistake about it. I know you don't want to hear it. I know you don't like it. But the church, in general, those who name the name of Christ, those who claim to represent Christ, are 100% responsible, along with governments that that are advised by church leaders, so-called, are 100% percent responsible. This includes the family, the head of household. We're 100% responsible for this plague. Not all the lost sinners on their way to hell, no, no, no. We can't blame them. Many of them are lost because we have never witnessed to them. We've never given them even a gospel track, never an invite to church. We're at fault. And I know you don't like it. I know you don't want to hear it. Oh, it's just, it's just a, a, a medical thing. No, it's not. This is a spiritual matter. So God wants us to repent. If you don't want this to continue on to the abyss, that is the complete destruction of America, The church, including families, need to repent of sanctioning and endorsing and okaying such things as homosexuality, homosexual marriage, and the homosexual agenda 100%. No excuses. No exceptions. And if the politicians want to see America continue the last two presidents whoever is in in, in, in all of the government officials and the Supreme Court they need to roll back everything dealing with sanctioning homosexuality, homosexual marriage uh, adoption of poor innocent children by homosexuals and uh, the homosexual agenda has to be rolled back and the truth of the matter is most pastors who are, who are leaning that way and, and all politicians don't have the courage to do so. They fear these homosexuals and lesbians more than they fear God because of the vindictiveness and the vileness and the meanness and the wickedness of the homosexuals and how much of a fit they would pitch. How much money they would lose. How that they would not fit in with everybody. They would not be politically correct anymore. Because the devil in this group has done a number on pastors and politicians. It's a tragedy. 
And now we have sown the wind and we're reaping the whirlwind for the devil and mankind trying to turn God's world upside down on its head. I know you don't like it. I know you're saying right now, I'll never listen to you again. Why are you picking on the uh, gays? I'm not picking on anybody. In fact, God loves the homosexuals. He wants them to get saved, and he wants them to repent of their sins, just like God wants us to repent of our adultery and our fornication. And that's another reason why you don't want to say anything to the gays. You don't want to, you don't want to go against them because they have your number. They know how much of a hypocrite you are how that you have a boyfriend and a girlfriend, you lying devil. See, this is the problem. And that's why the numbers are going up, up and up, way past what the models said. I, I knew that back then. It was, you know, bunk the models. Even the people who do the modeling say that model, models are all wrong. They're just all wrong. And, you know, I knew they were wrong then. We're going way past 60,000. Way past that. And the truth of the matter, the true count, and there's an article on bcn1.com about this today, the true count in America is well over 100,000, approaching 200,000 people are dead. So many people are dead. Read your Bible. God talked about the plagues causing so much damage, dead, dead, damage to dead bodies be all over the place. So many are dying in New York. The funeral home directors are stuffing bodies into U-Haul trucks. Not refrigerated. You heard that story today. People are dying everywhere. Because God is not pleased. One of the reasons why people must die when God sends the plague is because your most valuable asset in the world, outside of God, are human beings. That's why even presidents and governors will submit to shutting down the most powerful nation in the world because they know that if they lose the people, the economy be damned. There's no economy without the people. Leonard Ravenhill said, where, oh, where are the eternity conscious believers? Where are these souls on fire for God because they fear his holy name and presence and so live with eternity's values in view? So we come to our new segment. I've already told you about the Pew Research deal. Fifty-eight percent of black folk, African Americans, said that the coronavirus plague has impacted their spiritual life. It has caused them to go deeper spiritually in God. And that's the purpose of it. If that means confessing sin, repenting, telling folk, no, uh, we can't do that no more. Yeah, I know, I know, I, I know, I know, but we can't do that. I can't see you. I can't see you anymore. I'm married. I got children. I got grandchildren. And I'm getting ready to lose everything. Okay? Yeah, it was good while it lasted, but we can't, we can't, we can't let it last any longer, because God is not playing. Yeah, I know you, I know you, the deacon in the church and everything and all that, but uh, we can't do that anymore. That, that's what God wants to see. God wants to see some Christian folks, male and female, not answering phones from certain jokers, changing your phone number. Moving, no, no, yeah, we, I got to quit. I can't, I can't, I can't do that because God is stepping and God is not playing. And you, 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 you're acting very foolishly trying to get with me now. 
And you're married and I'm married. I'm married. You get your name off of Ashley Madison. I'm going to take mine off. Today, he exposed us before. And we didn't quit. But now the plague is on us. Anybody, we can, all, we can die. Our family members could die. We all could die. So we got to stop this foolishness. Let's not be foolish now. According to John Hopkins University, a very busy university, by the way, the United States recorded 2,502 coronavirus deaths in the past 24 hours. After two days of a relative easing in the toll on Sunday and Monday, the numbers have spiked again the past two days. Could it be because people are rushing to get back to the economy, uh, opening up prematurely? Uh, you mark my words. You mark my words. The states that are opening up prematurely are going to suffer there's going to be another shutdown. According to the Daily Mail, a top coronavirus model predicts that now no more 60,000 Americans will die, but over 100,000 Americans will be dead by the end of this summer. The end of this summer's first wave as the death toll has passed President Trump's best case scenario of 60,000 dead. According to the Sun of Great Britain, the world is on a knife edge as coronavirus cases spike and uh, Spike, cities shut down, and cities shut down again after lockdowns are lifted. The dangers of easing restrictions have been highlighted this week after Germany, after Germany and Spain saw cases spike as they tried to edge out of quarantine and a shelter-in-place situation. While China was forced to tighten regulations to fight off a second wave. So it's the same thing that uh, is happening in Germany and Spain. They eased up on the restriction and now more people are dying. That's going to happen in Georgia, it's going to happen uh, in Florida, it's going to happen across this country uh, if everybody continues to yield to the pressure. I told you that I would help you with uh, what I call the home family, home worship, uh, home school, and uh, home business. Today we're dealing with home worship or home church. Uh, Psalm 29 verse 2 says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Uh, Dr. Jason Halopoulos said, Family worship provides systematic discipleship and he's right about that the best discipleship program I believe with all of my heart is a loving father and mother who teaches their children the word of God you can really go deep because you're doing it on a daily basis as a pastor, I often, he said, have individuals approach me with a question about how to minister to their children or 
spouse in a specific area. Usually they are concerned about a particular sin or struggle in their family member's life. In this way, we serve as firefighters rushing to extinguish this issue or that. At times, this is needed, but it should not be our regular course of action. Systematic discipleship is a much better approach and is aided by family worship. Daily family worship will provide a strong foundation that is built upon hearing the Word of God daily, praying to God daily, and giving thanks to God daily. It takes time to build a strong house. It is an unsteady house that is the result of the carpenter running from shaky wall to hammer a nail in here or there. And he is so right about that. If you really want to build your family up, you do the hard work of prayer, Bible reading, and discipleship of your own children. Don't depend on the church any longer. Don't depend on the little uh, programs at the church. You do it yourself. Because oftentimes the programs at the church are just designed for play and courting and hot dogs and pizza and candy apples and just to keep your children away from the design to keep your children away from the real church service where they ought to be. I raised my children. They were always in church with us. <clears throat> I never left my children with anybody else. I know my wife did not like it. Uh, because she wanted a vacation from her children, like so many modern women today. But I said, no. Uh -uh. First of all, I don't trust these people. I don't care who, how much they call themselves Christians with my children. <clears throat> and so when we had to go to churches, visit churches, I had to preach in churches. My children were right there with my wife while I was preaching. He said, weren't you scared they were going to make noise and cry and boo-hoo? No, not at all, because they understood what was going to be the case when they got home when they did that. And your children would respond in the same way. And one of the beautiful things about it, when your children get older and they get grown, uh, from a parent's standpoint, if you really put in the time with your children like that and you're there with them, every day, all day, and teaching them and praying with them and all of that. Uh, you have a great feeling on the inside as a parent that uh, you spent quality time with your children. And uh, that when they leave, you don't, you, you're not going to have this, this empty nest syndrome. And if the children were good children, you're not going to be glad they are gone either. But you're going to have a good feeling that you did your job and uh, you, had, you had all that wonderful time with them. Hundreds of days. Hundreds of days. And you're going to feel good for the child that they're gone and living their life now. Having spent time Worshiping together every day, praying together every day, reading the Bible together every day, and teaching other subjects and doing this and doing business together, working together and so forth. It's a win-win situation. I highly recommend it. Is it, e is it easy? No. <clears throat> but it's worth it. Now, dear friend, if you're with us tonight and... Uh, you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and the free pardon of your sins. Allow me to show you how 
you can place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for your soul's salvation from the power of sin and the punishment of sin in that awful place, the burning hell. First, please understand with me that you are a sinner, and so am I, and that you have broken God's laws and commandments. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Please understand with me that because of your sins, you deserve eternal punishment in that awful place called hell. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. This includes both physical death and spiritual death in hell. Hell is bad news, dear friend. Hell is a place, Jesus said, Hell is a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It is amazing how people believe that there's a heaven, but they do do not. Or they say they don't believe there's a hell. That's a psychological thing of wishful thinking. But hell is a real place. Hell is a place of darkness. And the Bible refers to it as the blackness of darkness. What kind of darkness is that? Hell is a place of an agonizing memory. Abraham told Mr. Rich Man, do you remember? Do you remember how you had all of your good things and the poor man couldn't even get the crumbs that fell from your table. Do you remember Mr. Richman, Mr. Diabetes? But the saddest aspect of hell, dear friend, is that once you go through the gates of hell, they lock you in and you can't get out. So hell is bad news, but I have some good news for you tonight. Found in John 3.16, Jesus Christ said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The phrase, For God so loved the world, means that if you are in this world, God loves you, no matter what you have done. The next phrase, that he gave his only begotten son, refers to Jesus Christ. He is God's son who suffered, bled, and died on the cross for your sins and for mine. And he was buried and rose on the third day. Jesus Christ, our Savior, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou you shall be saved. Our next phrase is, that whosoever believeth in him. The word whosoever means anybody that anybody at any time in history who believes on Jesus Christ will be saved. Red, yellow, black, and white. We're all precious in his sight. The phrase believeth in him means to trust in him, to depend upon him, to rely on to have faith in him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou you shall be saved. Our next phrase, should not perish, refers to eternal punishment in that awful place called hell. And then lastly, the phrase, but have everlasting life. 
simply means to live eternally forever in heaven with God by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 10, 9, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou, you, you shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved to what? Saved to heaven. You're not saved to church. You're saved to heaven. Joining the church does not save you. Speaking in tongues does not save you. Getting baptized does not save you. Getting some money or giving some money does not save you. None of these things have anything to do with your soul's salvation. There's not, there's not enough money in the world to save your soul. For whosoever, there's that word whosoever again, anybody at any time. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved to what? Saved to heaven to be with God, to be with Jesus Christ, to be with the angels, to be at peace, to be with the beloved Christian family, saved by the grace of God. You may even have some family members up there waiting on you, praying for you, hoping for you to get saved, pulling for you. You can meet them on Hallelujah Boulevard streets of transparent gold, gold so pure, when you look down you can see through it. Why in the world would you want to miss that? So dear friend, if you're willing to believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ tonight for your soul's salvation, you're willing to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ, the sacrificial Lamb of God, took your place and mine. He took our sin upon, upon himself. He is the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. He suffered, he bled, and he died on the cross for your sin and mine. He took our place, was buried, and rose on the third day. Believe that in your heart and pray with me what is called the sinner's prayer and mean it from your heart. Repeat after me phrase by phrase and mean it from your heart. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner that I have done evil in your sight. I confess and I admit that I have broken your Ten Commandments, that I deserve to go to hell, just like a criminal deserves to go to jail. For I have lied before. I've stolen things before. I have coveted in my heart and lusted in my heart after people and things before. I have dishonored and disobeyed my parents. I have taken your holy name in vain and many other sins. For Jesus Christ's sake, your holy son, please have mercy and grace upon my soul. Please forgive me of all of my sins and save my soul from the hell that I deserve. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul. I receive you the free gift of salvation. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And help me to repent of my sins past. Help me to turn from my evil life. And to follow you in the new life. Lord Jesus. For it is in your name I pray.
Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, if you believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, that he died on the cross for your sins, he was buried and rose again on the third day, allow me to say to you congratulations on doing the most important thing in life, and that is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For more information, to help you grow in your newfound faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, please go to gospellightsociety.com, our evangelistic ministry, and read my pamphlet titled, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Shall go in and out and find pasture. If you trusted Jesus Christ tonight as your Savior, please email us at dw3 at gospellightsociety.com or whatever email is on your platform. We have some free material that we want to send you to help you to grow in the faith. Stand strong in the faith. If you have a prayer request, please email that to us as well today. I believe uh, Elizabeth added about four or five prayer requests to the list today or more. I saw quite a few prayer requests earlier today that I have not seen before. And we count it a privilege and an honor to pray for you. And we will pray for you until you tell us to stop. In the words of uh, Ruby Gooding, this is a praying time. If you're not praying now, you're praying later. So if there ever was a time to pray, my beloved, that time is now. Until next time, my beloved, which is tomorrow night around the same time, God loves you, we love you, and may God bless you real good is my prayer. Let's stand for our closing prayer. Holy Father God, we give you the glory, the praise, and the honor for the wonderful salvation that you wrought for such wretched, wicked, evil, and ungodly people as we are. We thank you for your Holy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and your Holy Word and for all of the millions manifold blessings that you bestowed upon us. Thank you for what you've done here tonight, what you're doing, and what you will do. Lord, I do pray that you would help us to uh, separate from one another at this moment uh, with a great afterglow. Help us, Lord, to be prayerful, sober-minded, vigilant, and watchful. Help us not to drop our God, for we're in the battle for our lives of our lives, rather, and Lord, I do pray that you will help us to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Deliver each and every one of us from temptation, evil, and sin. And grant us your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit tonight to live right, think right, and do right. And grant us all a great, safe, and peaceful night of rest. Lord, we pray for all of the people in the hundreds of thousands, yea, even millions who are hurting tonight like never before, and some are in shock because they have lost multiple um, family members to this, what some doctors call the beast, and uh, what I call the plague. And Lord, I do pray that you'll help people to be wise and to take wise counsel and to make the right moves going forward. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. And help us all to pray, seek your face, turn from our wicked ways, and humble ourselves. 
Amen. God bless you, dear friends. Until next time. He will say.